This is the mighty British Chieftain tank, a tank I'm very familiar with. Weighing 55 tonnes, it has a top speed of 28 miles per hour and a range of 310 miles. A Cold War creation, it was specifically designed to counter the threat posed by swarms of Soviet tanks that sat waiting across the East German border. Therefore, its design erred towards defensive usage, prioritising armour and firepower over manoeuvrability. It entered service in 1965, replacing the successful Centurion as Britain's first main battle tank until the Challenger 1 was phased in during the 1980s. The low silhouette of Chieftain made it ideal for hold down firing positions, where it would be hard to spot and hard to hit. The frontal armour was thick too, with a cleverly designed turret offering unrivaled protection for its time. But perhaps its best feature was its gun, the Royal Ordnance L11 A5, 120 millimetres of deadly firepower and accuracy. In fact, it was so good, it was used on Challenger 1. And it was whilst mounted on the Challenger 1 that this gun would scoop the record for the longest tank kill. When, in 1991, an Iraqi tank was knocked out from a range of over three miles. It's a record that still stands to this day. Inside, the crew of four enjoyed some protection from NBC attack, inside a pressurised crew compartment, whilst happily brewing tea using the famous boiling vessel. With all these impressive design features, some would say that the Chieftain tank was, in its time, the best tank in the world. And its crew would probably agree, as long as it broke down in a good firing position. The Achilles heel for the Chieftain can be found beneath the back decks in the shape of the L60 multi-fuel engine. This was a nature requirement that only the Brits seemed to adhere to, and in short, turned out to be a massive overcomplication that compromised performance. And as a result, tank crewmen like me found themselves spending far too much time on the tank part repairing them. But what's it like to drive? So here we are now, driver's cab at the Chieftain. I'm feeling super old as it was some 38 years ago that I trained to be a driver in this vehicle. Start up, I'm amazed I can actually remember the correct sequence to start up, i.e. GUE, up online, ensuring the green light's there to make sure it's charging and then the main engine on. You'll notice the gun is clamped over the back decks at the moment. This is just because there's a fault with the gun control equipment. Driver's position, super comfy, many nights spent sleeping in here in the past. I'm fully opened up at the moment, uh, but there is the, the ability to drop the seat, fully reclined position, close the hatch and then just rely on the driver's periscope to be able to see. Controls are straightforward. I'm changing gear with my left foot uh, using the gearbox controller pedal, pulling off in second. Um, there is six gears in total, but to be honest, looking at the size of this track, I think I'll be lucky to even get into fifth. Oops, gear change is not the best there. My crew would not be particularly happy. I'm certainly out of practice. Um, but the steering levers on this particular vehicle, it's good. The steering levers are good, responsive, and you know, it's chieftain. It's as about as smooth as you're gonna get for a ride. I feel like I'm 18 again. Though much maligned for its reliability, I still have a lot of affection for the Chieftain. And besides all that, it was a genuinely ambitious concept that pushed the limits of technology. Sadly, the engine pushed them just a bit too far. And that's what prevented this tank from achieving the export success that its forerunner, the Centurion, did. That's why just 1,800 were built, half serving with the British Army and the remainder sold to Kuwait, Jordan, Oman and Iran, who still operate them today.